The Middle Way Podcast with Pat and Saman. Thing we just wanted to start off with uh, is just if you could tell us a little bit about uh, what your your uh, your work is at, at UBC, how you're involved with uh, the vaccines, that maybe would be a, a great place to start. Yeah, absolutely. So my lab studies RNA vaccines and therapies. So um, in addition to thinking about, you know, it's it's been, I would say, a great year for the field of RNA vaccines with the approval of the Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna vaccines. Um, but what we're trying to do is think about, okay, how do we make vaccines even better? And how do we apply them to other applications where I think RNA could have a big impact? Um, So one of the ways we're doing this is we work with a specific type of RNA called self-amplifying RNA, which is just a fancy way of saying this RNA is able to copy itself once it gets into a patient's cells. And so this means we need a much lower dose than we would need with a typical messenger RNA. So we're thinking about ways of, you know, new vaccines, new disease indications where we could make vaccines and treatments for these. Interesting. So, and, and with that, just follow up to that. So with that technology and being able to have a lower dose of the mRNA, what are some of the advantages that would come with that? Yeah, so there's a number of advantages. So obviously, in the context of a pandemic, you know, when we're trying to manufacture billions of vaccines, if you can use 10 or 100 times lower dose, that means that from each batch of vaccines that, you know, we're currently producing, you'd have 10 or 100 times more doses. So it just goes a lot longer way. Um, But this should also mean that it's, you know, less expensive because it has less of the RNA in it. Um, And we also know now that from uh, studies have shown that there is is a pretty uh, direct relationship between the dose of RNA and the side effects that are associated with it. So if you got a COVID vaccine like the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccines and you had any sort of side effects, that's usually correlated directly with the dose of RNA used. So we're always looking to minimize the actual dose of RNA. Oh, that's great. So, so with that technology then for folks that are having reactions, that's going to make it even, even uh easier to take. uh, Ideally, yeah. So, yeah. So um, actually, uh, before I I joined UBC in January, and prior to this, I was working as a postdoc at Imperial College London. And so I was part of the team there that that did the first in-human clinical trial with this type of RNA. And just to put it into perspective, our clinical trial used a range of doses from 0.1 to 10 micrograms, whereas the Moderna vaccine is 100 micrograms and the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine is 30 micrograms. So it's quite a lower range compared wow. to that. That's a big, that's a big difference. I, I have had heard or read it somewhere else that the, uh, the Moderna dosage was higher and, and that was possibly or theoretically why there were um, more side effects or, or symptoms to to taking that. So that's that could be huge. So when do you think something that technology might actually be uh, put into play? Yeah, good question. So I think, you know, there's lots of people that are developing, um, you know, kind of second generation vaccines for COVID, but also other indications. So um, hard to say exactly when it would get approved just because it's, yeah, it kind of depends on, you know, obviously how the clinical trials go, et cetera. Um, So we're waiting to see. And, And did you say the trials have already started for that or? Yeah, so that was um, the ones I was involved at at Imperial in London. Uh, the phase one to com- was completed in January. Um, so yeah, they yeah will either move on to a phase three now or um, you know go back and iterate on the formulation to to further improve it. That's exciting. That's really exciting. That would be great. Uh, one person that wrote in and they referred to a Japanese study that they had read about that showed. Uh, basically what was happening to the the lipid nanoparticles from the vaccine. And uh, I guess the Japanese study found that uh, the majority of of them dispersed through the body or or, or remained in the injection site dispersed through the body, but they found, I guess, about 15% or something like that, or percentage uh, was in the liver uh, for a short time. And then there were very minute percentages that went into uh, other organs like the the heart, uh, the brain, the spleen, uh, and so forth, the lungs. Um, and I guess what what this person was writing is that their understanding of the study was that again those 
particles didn't stay in those organs for very long. Um, but their question was, is it possible that because obviously the uh, lipid nanoparticles that are, are part of the, uh, the vaccine are uh, associated with the spike protein, at least temporarily, when it's created, is it possible that there could be trace elements of the spike protein, not the protein itself, but trace elements uh, in those nanoparticles so that let's say it goes into the heart, maybe that particle is only gonna be there for a few days, but that the body's immune system, which has now been activated to react to uh, the spike protein, senses perhaps a little bit like a trace particle in the heart and uh, perhaps in, in young men or certain cases where there's a really active immune system, could it be uh, reacting to uh, what it's reading as, as some spike protein there and that causing that, that inflammation response? Is, that, is there a Yeah, really, really interesting theory. So I guess I'm not familiar with that study, so I'd have to look more into it. And um, yeah, hard to know because really like the best way to do that study would be to do it and take samples in people, right? But it sounds like it was a biodistribution study that um, you know, probably was done in either mice or rats. And so, it, you know, depends a lot on like what dose they use and what time points they were looking at. Right. So take that with a grain of salt that I haven't seen this study. Um, so I guess from what I have seen in the studies that I've seen, the spike protein is expressed for about three to five days um, with these messenger RNA vaccines. So yeah, I, I guess, yeah, from my understanding, we just don't know quite the mechanism yet of what is causing this myocarditis, but people are definitely looking into it. Um, but I will say as well, you know, in a, in a lot of these cases, um, the myocarditis, you know, it's not always fatal, right? So many of the patients that have that fully recovered from it. The Middle Way Podcast with Pat and Simon.